Good morning and welcome to the first installment of Bowman's 2020 Breakfast with Benefits series. Uh, this is the first time we're delivering Breakfast with Benefits uh, by webinar and unfortunately it's the first time you're providing your own breakfast as well. Um, but maybe we'll find a way to address that technologically uh, at a point in the future. I see that um, participants are slowly uh, loading up. Uh, it's quite exciting to watch the dial. We're we just cracked 104, um, but we'll continue as, we, as we're going. I'm the facilitator for today's webinar. My name is David Jarrell, and I head up the Banking Financial Services Regulatory Team at uh, Bowman's. Um, I'll introduce the rest of our panelists shortly, but there are first a few housekeeping points just to enhance everybody's uh, webinar experience. Firstly, as participants, you are all automatically muted. So should you have any questions during the webinar, which we do encourage, please use the Q&A button at the bottom uh, center of your screen. Please do not use the chat function. We won't be monitoring that, but we will be monitoring the Q&A function. Um, and all the questions will come through to me and hopefully we can cover all of them, um, but I will certainly select uh, a good sample of them uh, in the worst case scenario uh, and, and allocate those to members of the panel to discuss at an appropriate time during the webinar. We won't be answering questions live when they come in. So if I haven't addressed your question immediately, please don't send it again. I will uh, note it and get around to it. Um, yeah, we won't be able to respond in writing to individual questions. Uh, we will talk, uh, we will answer the questions live uh, during the course of the webinar. Um, so please keep the questions as concise as you can, preferably raise one uh, point per question so that I can allocate it easily, we can get through your, your interests. We've prepared a poll, by the way, um, which should appear on your screen in a few seconds, I would imagine. It'll be open for about 20 minutes. There you go, it just appeared on my screen. Um, there are five questions, I believe. Uh, we'd be very interested to understand uh, what your experiences are or have been and what you anticipate in relation to benefits leading up to and during the lockdown, as well as plans and expectations for the future. Your responses will be anonymous. Uh, so please don't feel shy uh, or concerned about submitting anything, not that there's much that's controversial here. Um, we as the hosts won't know who's uh, answered the poll and how, um, and uh, the poll itself won't declare that, so please uh, don't be put off from participating by concerns about privacy. The webinar is being recorded. Um, the recording will be posted um, probably before this time tomorrow on our website, which is www.vermanslaw.com. Uh, there is a coronavirus specific page and this will appear on that page. Um, in any event, we will send a link of the recording to everybody who uh, is participating in the call as a participant today, all 144 of you so far. You are welcome to forward the link uh, of the recording, should you wish to do so, to persons who couldn't make the uh, session today, or even persons who haven't, uh, who haven't registered. Um, there are no concerns in that regard. So some context <clears throat> for today's uh, Breakfast of Benefits, Benefits seminar to start with. Employee benefits is a term, uh, as most of you will know, that we used to refer to the benefits or advantages of employment other than monetary cash payment by way of salary or wage. And some benefits are provided directly by an employer, for example, canteen allowances, petrol allowances, travel allowances, telephone, airtime, etc. It gets factored into the operational cost of making an employee productive and the employer uh, makes uh, that available. So it's got a financial element, um, but some of the key financial benefits um, that are important to employees and that we, we deal with regularly um, are things like retirement savings, life cover, funeral cover, medical aid, um, disability, pension-backed housing loan arrangements. And these are generally sourced through or with the assistance of a number of third parties, service providers to the employers uh, and or to the employees, depending on which structure we're talking about. Now with the advent of the uh, COVID-19 crisis, the implementation of the lockdown, Many employers we understand and we've experienced are looking to cut costs, it's understandable, uh, due to liquidity constraints. 
can employers at this time be cutting the costs associated with pensions, medical aid, and death and disability benefits? You know, these are obviously top of mind questions. And what happens to the contributions that are due to the various third party schemes if the employee is unable to work and is not being paid? In the case where the employer makes direct contributions, like in a pension fund, uh, where the employer lacks the liquidity or not just liquidity, the financial, anticipated financial resources to be able to do so. This is not really a time uh, for employees to be kicked off medical aid schemes or to lose their death and disability benefits and, and related types of cover. So what can and should an employer do in these circumstances? These are the kinds of questions uh, that we hope to help guide you through today. Specifically, we will also address what has been the response of the regulator, the Financial Sector Conduct Authority um, and the Council for Medical Schemes. Um, in re relation to employees who may not be able to continue with their contributions. And what does the suspension of contributions mean? It may have different meanings in different contexts. So these are the matters that we'll focus our presentations on today. Our panelists, I'll introduce them to you. Firstly, Lysander Rapulu is the head of Bowman's Employment Practice. Uh, Graham DeMant and Deirdre Phillips are both partners with significant experience and expertise in the field of employee benefits. Lusanda will be starting uh, today for us. She will take us through how the world of employee benefits could, should, and may need to change in response to changes in the way that people work, not necessarily just in response to the, uh, to the lockdown arrangements around the world, but more generally in the context of changes in the way of work generally. Um, often referred to in the context of the fourth industrial revolution or, or 4IR. We are in a different world of work, things are different. Uh, the pandemic has struck us at a time when we were already facing a lot of change and Lysander has a lot of experience in, in addressing and helping employers through some of those changes. Deirdre and I in turn will share our thoughts on how the different regulators, the FSCA and the CMS, um, have responded to the current crisis and how they have suggested or how they've directed um, that employers um, and service providers and members themselves should be responding in these, in these circumstances. Um, and that's obviously in relation to retirement funding, um, insurance, um, as well as medical schemes. Um, and then Graham will uh, give his insights on uh, maybe slightly more practical day-to-day -day type of approach to what employers, uh, scheme trustees, mancos um, need to be paying attention to in these circumstances. What decisions need to be made, when and how those decisions need to be made, who the relevant decision makers are. Um, and a lot of this is, is particularly important when, you, when regard is had to liquidity and cost management measure, measures at the employer level or the reallocation of available resources from the employer side. So, uh, without further ado, um, I'll hand over to you, Lysander, to talk us through the, uh, the new world of work. David. Morning, everybody. I think ordinarily what we all understand in relation to the new world of work is the exponential increase in the use of technology in work in the way that work is done, in where work is done from, people now being able to work from home, having flexibility in that regard, working from a coffee shop, working from a doctor's waiting room when your child is sick, et cetera. That's what we see and that's what we understand in relation to an individual's working life. Um, in relation to companies, we see it in relation to mining, healthcare, et cetera, in the increased use of artificial intelligence and technology and robotics in general in, in the work, in how work is done, in the use of human beings and the part that they play in the whole component of doing work. What COVID-19 has done in relation to the ordinary working day and flexibility in that regard is that it has brought to the forefront and has given employers zero choice in allowing their employees to work from home. And in that regard, the use of technology has become increasingly important. From the software to the hardware to the IT support, um, et cetera. So in terms of benefits, the benefits of technology for individual employees, for them working from home, 
has have become increasingly important and vital for business continuity at this time and for some vital for business survival at this time. For employees to do work. Things such as the travel allowance have become absolute because many people are not traveling unless you are in essential services, but for most people, they are not needing the travel benefits. And even as we are now in level four, there's still minimal travel and we're still all expected and encouraged to work from home and only travel when it's extremely necessary. So some things that were ordinary, such as travel allowances, are now actually becoming things that are not needed. And some things that were seen as perks for executives, such as laptops, etc., are now provided to all level of workers, and all level of workers need these things in order to do work. COVID-19 has brought healthcare to the forefront and the importance of worker health. With this, it means an increase in the importance of things such as medical aid, things such as general cover. Um, so the benefit is increasingly important. At the same time, it has brought a world where the contribution to those benefits is becoming an issue. We're seeing a time now where employees, some are having reduced income, and therefore, whether the contribution of things such as medical aid, the funeral cover, and all those things should come from employers fully, or whether they should still be an employee component become increasingly important to employees and what they consider as important to them um, in, in the world of work. So all these things become increasingly important. I think what's also important to to understand is that the things that are important are important depending on the different levels of workers. So for example, for your blue collar workers, for people for whom coming to work and getting a meal at the canteen is important to them in getting a meal in their stomach, for those people it benefits such as food vouchers, etc., may be something that's important to them. Whereas for your more managerial employees, it benefits such as a laptop, and a print at home is something that's important to them. For more executive employees who can provide things like life cover um, and funeral cover for themselves, those, are, those things may not be necessarily that much more important to get at the workplace, but for your blue collar workers who, you know, uh, are the ones who may value getting things such as funeral cover um, from the workplace and the increase of those things and how much of it is provided um, by the employer and how much of it they are required to, to contribute to. So I think it's important to differentiate uh, between different levels of workers, but I think also it's important to differentiate between different workplaces and that these things will all be very much specific to different workplaces and different um, levels of workers and different employers will have to grapple with these within their own organizations. Within that, they should put in place the required policies and procedures so that it's clear to workers what the rules are um, and what's doable and what's not doable. In terms of other benefits such as leave, um, I think things such as sick leave, um, family responsibility leave will become much more important to workers. Um, and, you know, for when you have um, young children or elderly um, family members that are with you, things such as family responsibility leave become increasingly more important for some employees so that they um, do what they need to do in relation to their the wider um, family life. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's very, very various things that need to be considered um, and I think that they, they vary in relation to different levels of employees and different organizations. And I think that employers will need to put in together the different policies that are required. Um, obviously, there'll be a level of consultation that's required to the extent that there are already policies in place um, and already benefits in place and employers want to make changes to those. Um, and those changes to terms and conditions will require um, consultation, um, agreement, 
um, and um, um, a process between employers and employees um, to navigate between what may be current benefits and um, benefits that have become more important um, in future and, and putting those in place. Thank you, Lysander. Um, yeah, there's a lot of food for thought there. Um, and you've prompted a few questions, which is exciting to see. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take the questions back to you a bit later. I think let's get the contributions from Deirdre and, and Graham first. But thank you very much. We've got a nice batch of questions coming through, which we'll pick up later, as I promised. Um, and now, um, Deirdre um, will talk to us quickly um, regarding uh, the situation with the Financial Sector Conduct Authority and their approach in relation to uh, pension funds. Thanks, David. Good morning, everybody. So the question is, what has the FECA basically done with employers um, being in financial distress? And luckily, we've seen that the FECA has moved quite swiftly. For example, on the eve, just prior to the, the, the lockdown um, on the 26th, the FECA issued its first um, communication in relation to retirement fund contributions and acknowledge that we are in uncharted territories. Um, employers might be in financial distress. They may not be able to pay contributions. What are, what are employers supposed to do? What are employers' rights? What are employ, uh, employees' um, rights as well? So the one, the one notice was like I mentioned, specifically in relation to fund contributions. And essentially what the FECA had said, you know, the FECA regulating retirement funds and insurers amongst other uh, financial institutions advised that if, if an employer is financially distressed and cannot pay the full or can only pay a partial contribution, what should an employer do? And the, the FECA basically told the industry, please funds go and look at your rules listen to your employers and accommodate them to the extent necessary. So typically a fund rule would allow for absence of work or suspension of contributions or um, reducing of pensionable salary. But what does that mean? And should this then, I mean, we've seen a lot of questions where these, this could um, possibly also be abused by employers, but I don't think all of them. Um, the, the, the fact of the matter is if you can't pay contributions, what will happen to your benefits. So what the FECA has advised is the employers should open an engagement with their, with their funds, go and look at your fund rules and see if there is an absence of work rule or is there a suspension of contribution rule or is there a general rule that allows for a remuneration to be reduced and therefore for fund contributions to be reduced. Um, the, the majority of fund rules obviously didn't deal with doesn't deal with COVID. It didn't. We we never foresee anything like this. So lots of funds are tapping into the absence of of work rule. Now, it's not a one size fits all approach. I don't think some of the rules we've seen. Not all of the absence of work rule would apply. And you know what does that mean? We were, uh, work remotely. Does that now mean that I'm absent from work? No, not necessarily. I'm just absent from my workplace, but I still can work. And um, the rule is if remuneration is still payable, Section 13A of the Pension Funds Act requires the employer to make those deductions and to pay the contributions over to the fund. Um, if, you know, non-compliance with Section 13A is a criminal offence, and I can understand why the FECA moved quite swiftly in issuing its communication on the eve of the lockdown to advise that, you know, funds move fast, um, do your rule amendments where it's necessary, and if there is going to be a reduction in, in remuneration, your contribution to the fund would also probably affect it, be affected and a reduced contribution will be payable. Um, I think some of the options when employers do have regard to reducing their, their, their contributions, what we've advised and what the FECA has also said is that you need to think what the effect would be on your insured benefits. So for example, uh, if a, say you, your, your contribution is 10% and the, the employer can only pay 5%, which portion of that 
will go to the retirement funding, which portion of that will go to risk benefits, i.e. Your, um, your death and disability benefits. What the FECA has cautioned is that if there is going to be a reduction or a suspension of, of fund benefits, at least then ensure that your risk benefits are covered in the event that the employee dies or becomes permanently disabled. Um, what we've also seen is that apart from retirement fund contributions, the FECA has also issued a notice in relation to insurance um, policyholders. For example, um, where an employer has its own risk benefit uh, you know, policy in place for funeral cover, disability benefits, income protection, that if you are going to reduce your, your salary um, or no contributions or premiums are being paid, what is the knock-on effect on those other type of employee benefits? Um, and that there needs to be this communication with your, your employees as to if you are going to cut, you know, what are you going to do about um, those benefits? David, you're on mute. Thank you. Alt A, a new trick I learned this morning. Um, on the on the medical side of things, the similarly to the FSCA, uh, the Council of Medical Schemes, which is the medical schemes regulator, has also issued uh, some suggestions, but they a little bit more muted, um, and uh, and certainly not as numerous. Uh, they're basically two. The one was Circular 25 that they issued on the 26th of March, and the other one is Circular 28, which was issued on the uh, 10th of April. Neither speaks directly to employers, which, um, which is not surprising because the Council for Medical Schemes regulates medical schemes. Um, and one of the interesting and, and important uh, things to always remember with medical schemes is that technically there are no employer contributions into medical schemes. Um, the, only the member is a member of the medical scheme. There may be a participation agreement between the employer and the medical scheme for certain operational reasons, but the employer doesn't contribute its own funds. It may be the case that the employer has agreed in terms of the employment contract with its employees that it will subsidize a portion of the member's uh, obligation to the medical scheme, but that doesn't change the fact that it's, it's still a member contribution uh, to the medical scheme. And that subsidy may range anything from 0 to 100%. Um, and of course, we know in some cases it might even be applicable to uh, persons who've retired from the scheme. Um, but the reason it's quite important is because the council's approach is really to talk to medical schemes and medical scheme members. And the issue here is whether or not medical scheme members' membership can be terminated for failure to pay. Now, unlike Section uh, 13A of the Pension Funds Act, there's, there's quite a tight, far tighter time frame in the Medical Schemes Act. You've got three days after a contribution is due for it to be paid over. Um, so um, that needs to happen pretty smartly. Um, usually a, a scheme's rules will provide for suspension and in due course termination of membership for failure to take contributions. So, so if an employee is accustomed to his or her employer making that payment on his or her behalf um, and the employer can't do that because of liquidity constraints um, or other financial constraints then the employee could be end, end up being expelled from the scheme which uh, which which obviously uh, take morality and things aside would just be unfortunate and, and and not a very good place for employees to be um, the the other situation is where the employer deducts and remits the members portion um, so it's got nothing to do with whether or not the employer can afford it, but the employee can no longer afford it. And for, for example, perhaps does not want that deduction to be paid over or wants some sort of um, intervention to be made. These are all situations um, where one is, as Lissander said earlier, going to be faced with uh, the need to consult in some way in order to decide um, what is going to be changed as between the employer and the employee, and also to engage with the medical scheme um, to decide what is going to be agreed between the medical scheme and the employer in relation to the employees, and then ultimately to see what can be taken up to the Council for Medical Schemes for relaxation. So the question becomes uh, what relaxations are available. Now, um, Circular 25 doesn't say a lot, um, but it does say that a scheme 
So there's a positive duty, regardless of any approaches by anybody, for a scheme to investigate uh, disruptions that it anticipates due to the pandemic um, and the, uh, the chances that it may need to be looking at uh, things like uh, suspensions or even terminations based on what it anticipates uh, the experience to be. The, the, the registrar or the Council for Medical Schemes doesn't preclude the possibility of terminations. They just say that schemes must exercise grace and understanding. Circular 28, which as I said, came out in April, um, uh, it responded uh, in, in far more detail um, and it said it rejected an industry proposal. Industry had proposed that there's something like 60 billion in medical scheme reserves, so why not use that to, to create effectively um, a contribution holiday, a blanket exemption. The Council for Medical Schemes rejected that because of its concerns about the differing liquidity levels of different schemes and the risks that this could pose to different schemes. Um, but it does say that it will entertain specific applications by particular medical schemes um, to come up with arrangements for effectively contribution uh, suspensions. Now, um, the employers will need to liaise with the medical schemes because the council doesn't take applications from employers. Um, so one of the practical issues here is obviously that the employers themselves aren't going to be directly in control of these application processes. On the other hand, scheme trustees have a duty to ensure that money that is due to the scheme comes in. Um, so it, it's possible, I'm not suggesting that it's probable, but at this stage it's possible that in certain schemes circumstances, it might be difficult for the scheme trustees to think that this is a good idea and to motivate these kinds of applications to the Council for Medical Schemes in good faith. So there's going to be an element of, of, of governance management that, that I would imagine might creep in as well. In any event, no exemption is going to be granted for three months. Uh, the council has asked schemes to demonstrate what the anticipated impact of the um, of claims around the, the, the pandemic circumstances is going to be on schemes um, and also the actual investment impact because that's the problem. There's two sides of the coin. There's a claims experience that might rise, but there's also uh, the reserves are invested somewhere markets um, and uh, things like um, downgrades don't help investment performance. So Circular 28 proposes um, a number of options. The one is to use member savings accounts to offset contributions. Now that ordinarily would contravene regulation 10.3 because you can't use member savings accounts for that. Um, and because member savings accounts are amounts that are effectively uh, additional contributions by members, the scheme can't do this without an approach by a member. So a member would have to request um, and in cir some circumstances, a rule amendment may be required by the medical scheme to, to do this. Um, the, the, the problem that this creates, of course, is that if somebody is uh, looking ahead and has foresight and says, well, all members should be having this benefit, um, that's not a request from an individual member in relation to his or her medical savings account. So it might be that some um, assistance uh, or forum for members to get together and say this is something that we as a group want would need to be considered, um, but ultimately it's going to be uh, implemented at an individual level. The council has also suggested the consideration of granting certain benefits on an ex gratia basis, which is interesting because a few years back council said they don't like ex gratias and no, no such benefits can be granted, but be that as it may, the context that is being raised here is that medical schemes are allowed to grant financial assistance to their members. It's not something you see often. Medical schemes tend to offer a comprehensive package. But technically, in terms of the Medical Schemes Act, medical schemes can also assist members to purchase services, healthcare services, from other places and can render them financial assistance in that regard. Um, now, that doesn't that financial assistance doesn't contemplate relaxation or offset of contributions. So in order to uh, take an ex gratia approach to assisting with contributions, you still need to go through the usual exemption application process at the Council for Medical Schemes. But given that it was the council that suggested this, um, you can expect um, that they, they're trying to be innovative here and, and will look upon these kinds of requests with some um, with grace. Um, 
the difficulty, uh, the risk here, and, and this, it's a real risk and the council itself does point it out, is that if you are granting financial assistance, because that's the way it's phrased in the Medical Schemes Act to your members, um, you've got to be careful of getting into National Credit Act stuff. In other words, granting loans, granting loans with interest, um, uh, offering to render services uh, on a deferred basis, which effectively have some sort of cost uh, of service associated with them. I'm not an NCA expert. What I do know about the NCA is that it's very difficult, very complicated, and that you must not venture anywhere close to it without, uh, without uh, knowing exactly what you're doing. So um, this, of course, isn't a concern for employers, it's a concern for medical schemes. But when approaching medical schemes with these kinds of suggestions, employers would need to expect a very cautious response from medical schemes in relation to what is effectively um, the best tool they've got for a contribution holiday arrangement. Then there's an SME relief uh, package, no, not a package, a proposal from the council which says that employees who have less than, well, employers who have less than 200 employees uh, may wish to negotiate payment plans with medical schemes. Um, of course, a payment plan uh, doesn't, there's not much detail and it doesn't suggest a non-contribution. It doesn't su suggest a waiver of contributions. It suggests a way to make payment of contributions that are being suspended. There aren't details in the circular. I'm not aware of anyone who has negotiated a payment plan yet, um, but it does raise big questions. You know, if if your contribution is the equivalent as a member of 5% of your package and there's a suspension of contributions for four months, suddenly the amount that's due is now 20% of your package. So who's going to cushion that? How's it going to be cushioned? How's it going to get paid? Is this something that employers in constrained circumstances themselves might be able to subsidize or, or make uh, as an additional benefit in some way? I'm not sure. It's going to depend on individual circumstances. But the point is that uh, there are options there. They're going to require you to go through the forum of your medical scheme. And it's not very clear um, how those discussions are going to pan out. Um, I think at this stage, it would be interesting to hear from Graham, um, in your experience, what some of the considerations may be that employers and their own internal organizational structures need to be factoring uh, into their decision-making processes and how they engage and who engages with whom um, in order to, to take the next steps in these circumstances. Thanks, David, and uh, morning to everybody. Um, what I'm gonna do is just talk briefly about the background to the relationship that you have when you provide benefits, be it pension benefits, medical aid, group life or disability and the nature of that relationship. I'm then gonna talk about those employees who are still receiving remuneration because they can work and where an employer needs to cut costs. And we've already been approached by a number of employers that have liquidity issues and are looking to cut costs either by remuneration cuts or by re-looking at their benefits. Thirdly, I wanna just talk about what happens with those employees who cannot work, who are not being paid and whose contributions are not being made and what happens to their respective benefits as well. When we talk about employee benefits and particularly pensions, medical aid, group life, we are not talking about a usual relationship where you simply have the two parties, employer and employee. You're essentially, you're dealing with a tripartite relationship where there are three parties to the relationship. So you've got in the case of a pension fund, the fund, in the case of the medical aid, the scheme, and in the case of disability and death, you've got an insurance provider. So there are three parties to this relationship. And you've got to look at the whole contractual relationship between all three. So the first thing you do is you've got to look at the contract between you and the employee to decide what it is you can and cannot do. Then you've got to look at your rules with the scheme and with the fund or your policy in respect of the insurer as to what it is that you can and cannot do. And then to make it worse, you've got to look at the legislative environment because this is a highly regulated space and there's legislation that governs all of those relationships as well. So 
you can't just simply go about cut, cutting costs, cutting contributions uh, without very carefully considering the contracts, the rules, and the regulations as well. Um, to make it worse, sometimes this tripartite relationship, I don't know what you call a four-way relationship, um, but a quadrite quadri quadri relationship, I don't know. Anyway, where you have a, an approved policy where the fund actually has a policy that provides insurance benefits. So you get through the rules, your death or disability benefit, and then there's a policy on top of that as well. So you've got to look at that in addition as well when you want to make those particular changes. Now, the, when we look at contracts, what we're looking to do is to decide whether you've got to actually reach an agreement with employees to change any of these benefits or terms and conditions, or you're looking at whether you can do so unilaterally because you've reserved yourself a discretion to do so. And I'm gonna talk about that discretion just now as well and just how effective it is or not, but you've got to look at that. And unfortunately, what we found is that a lot of contracts are not very carefully drafted when it comes to employee benefits. So it makes it even worse to try and understand the contractual arrangement. Some simply provide for membership of a fund. You must become a member of the retirement fund. You become a member of the ex-medical aid. And we can change that from time to time. We've got a discretion to choose our, our particular provider. Some define the contribution rates that you will make. So they will say you've got to make a particular contribution and they will do that from there. Then some provide a discretion to change rates or benefits and some simply refer to policies that will incorporate the benefits. So you've got to understand exactly what it is that you're dealing with. What we've also seen in recent times, not so recent, probably from the early 2000s onwards, was a shift to the concept of a total cost to company remuneration. So very often the contract is drafted that your entire package is worth 1 million rand, for instance. You can decide on the benefit allocation and you can allocate so much to medical aid, to retirement funding, or whatever it is. Now, if you've drafted it on a total cost to company benefit, it doesn't help you to go and reduce your contributions because all that's going to do is increase the remuneration. So if you've done it on that basis, you, again, you've got to look very, very carefully. If you've drafted it on the basis of basic remuneration plus benefits, then it's different. Then you've got to understand, well, can I change those benefits? Can I do so by negotiation or can I do so by unilaterally? So in, in terms of any changes that you wish to make, it's all well and good that the FSCA has said you may be able to take a contribution holiday. It's all very well and good that the Medical Schemes Council is looking at ways to accommodate what happens with no contributions. But you can't simply go and take advantage of those. You've got to go back and understand all of these relationships before you before you do anything. Now, even where you've got a discretion, and we, we've got a, quite a lot of employers who have carefully drafted to reserve themselves a discretion when it comes to benefits. What the courts have said is that the unfair labor practice definition that says and regulates unfair conduct in relation to the provision of a benefit, that definition regulates all your discretions and the exercises of those discretions. So you can't just simply go and exercise whatever discretion you like. You've got to have a rational and substantive basis for what you're doing. So in other words, it's got to pass the substantive hurdle. Is what you're doing rational and is it reasonable? Then it's got to pass the procedural hurdle. You can't do it without allowing the employees to be heard through some form of consultation process. So you've got to realize that you're, even in a discretionary basis, you've got to exercise that discretionary discretion fairly. Now, where, where are we talking of cutting costs? We really are talking about those employees who can continue to work and who are working and are rendering service and are being paid. And they're entitled to remuneration. And the question is, can you suspend or can you reduce contributions? Now, in most cases, that is going to involve a change to terms and conditions of employment. And that you can't unilaterally do. So that would require negotiation and it would require agreement. 
if it's a discretion, as I've indicated, then you're going to have to exercise that discretion rationally and fairly, and that's going to involve consultation. Now, what then happens if you go to your employees and you say, I want to reach agreement with you in order to reduce costs. I've got to save costs. I want to agree with you that either we're going to cut your remuneration or either we're going to reduce your benefits and we, and we need your agreement. Now, usually the way that you would approach a cost cutting exercise, I need to reduce costs, I need you to do something differently, is you would invoke a section 189 or a section 189 capital A retrenchment process. So that's what you would do. But a retrenchment process normally means cutting people. It's cutting people out of the business, it's cutting jobs. What you're doing then is you're putting up as an alternative to cutting jobs, you say to employees, instead of cutting the jobs, are you all prepared to take a salary haircut? Are you all prepared, instead of a salary haircut, not to have the benefits anymore? We'll take away, we'll exit the pension fund. We'll exit whatever benefits, we'll reduce the life cover, produce less life cover at less cost. Now those are put up as alternatives in a retrenchment scenario. And employees have to agree to those alternatives. If they don't agree to it, they say, no, we don't, uh, we don't care if 50% of people lose their jobs, as long as I've got my job but don't cut my benefits. If you can't get that, that agreement, your fallback is cutting people. Your fallback isn't cutting, uh, cutting benefits. So if you go the 189 route, you must always realize that the ultimate possibility is you're not gonna get the cut benefits or remuneration, you're gonna get less people in, in a cost saving scenario. So then your other alternative is a negotiation scenario where you go into a negotiation with your employees to cut their remuneration or to cut their benefits. And in a negotiation scenario, it's all very well and good if you've got a, a union and you've got a collective bargaining ar arrangement, those are usually easier to facilitate. When you're, when you're dealing with workers who are not organized, now you've got to deal with them individually. And your fallback scenario in a, a negotiation scenario where you can't get agreement is a deadlock, referral to the CCMA, and then a lockout of your employees. You close them out of your premises, you refuse to pay them until they capitulate to your demand. So that is your lockout type scenario, which generally speaking, employers don't wanna do with workers who are, other than blue collar workers, unionized environment where lockouts may be utilized. I've yet to see an employer utilize a lockout for its executives, for its higher managerial issues. You generally find that it's not good for morale to lock your executives and your managers out of a business um, at, in order to force them to capitulate to a reduced wage. So it's not usually used, but it is a mechanism and we are in desperate times. We are in times that are uncharted and I envisage that there may be some employers at this point in time who may actually contemplate lockouts of employees who refuse to take remuneration cuts or benefit cuts in the context of um, what we're actually dealing with at the moment. Then finally, what I want to do is, is turn to those employees who can't work and are unable to tender their services. They may not leave their homes and they are unable to come to work. Now, the, the, the general principle of somebody who's unable to tender their services is that it's no work, no pay. You don't tender, I'm under no obligation to pay you. So that's the normal thing. Now with pension funds, your contribution is ordinarily a factor as a percentage of your remuneration. As you're not earning any remuneration, there is no percentage contribution to deduct or to pay over to the pension fund. So it's almost automatic that as a consequence of the fall in remuneration that there's going to be an automatic fall in the contribution. With medical aid you've got a fixed contribution and that contribution is ordinarily deducted from an employee's remuneration and now there is no remuneration to deduct from so you are unable to take from that employee's remuneration to pay that contribution over on that member's behalf 
to the medical aid. So there is nothing to pay to the medical aid from the employee. You can't take that money. In group life and disability, again, you need to look at your policy, but some of them are a factor of a percentage of remuneration, but that is ordinarily annually determined as opposed to monthly determined. So you may be under an obligation to continue to contribute. Similarly, it may be a fixed amount that the employer, because of the employer policy, is obliged to contribute, in which event it's your relationship with the insurer. You must continue to make that payment regardless of whether your workers are working or not. Now, that's the legal scenario. Now, clearly, what the, the last thing we want at this point in time, and it's very undesirable for medical scheme members to be losing their me membership of a medical aid, to be losing any group life or disability benefits. I think people need it more than ever at this point in time. So what should you as an employer be doing? Well, firstly, in my view, in terms of the duty of good faith and the duty of care that you owe to your employees, at the very least, you need to notify your employees of anything that may jeopardize any one of their benefits. So you need to tell them your benefits are going to be at risk so that they are able to make an alternative arrangement. If there's no medical aid contribution, they can source another, if they're possible, they source another and they make that medical aid contribution. So at the very least, you need to be advising, guys, you are at risk in relation to this. You can obviously try and make alternative arrangements. So for instance, advance the payment to the medical aid. David spoke about some complexities around that, but it's certainly something that you need to explore, whether you don't continue to make that contribution notwithstanding that the employee is unable to have a deduction made and paid over to the medical aid and see whether you can then recoup it at a later point in time. Um, and if there's any prospect at all that any benefits are going to be lost, go to the service providers to see what it is that you can do. But simply don't just step back and allow these things to lapse for any reason whatsoever. That would be my, my advice to you as well. So, David, that's uh, it from my side. I think I've given a, a legal sense. I know that some employers are claiming TERS benefits from the Unemployment Insurance Fund, but you know maybe uh, Lusanda can come in and just chat about that in terms of what that actually means. Lusanda, before you do, um, we've got 25 questions, which is fantastic. Um, one isn't a question. Um, somebody has informed us that it's a quadratic relationship. Thank you very much for that. Uh, there you go, Graham. Um, it's like nice wife swapping. So when you're yeah. wife swapping, you're in a quadratic relationship. Okay, we'll just edit that one out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, there have been a number of questions. It's interesting. I just quickly wanted to pick up on this. The one thing there's the, the sort of a couple of competing themes here. The one is um, about cutting costs and the other one is about reallocating costs. Um, so it, the, the question is, can you, for example, would it be an idea for an employer to reallocate the savings on office rent in this new way of working uh, towards home office allowances? Because those are clearly going to kick up. Um, there's a factual question here about uh, you know, mobile companies, uh, telecom industries have probably seen an increase in data usage. Um, are employers responding accordingly with data, cell phone allowances, and overall digitization of the home office? These are sort of speculative and, and a bit factual, so I'm not sure we can answer them from a legal perspective, but I think um, they do certainly talk to the underlying factors that need to be considered, because as Graham said, everything uh, discretion, decisions, um, proposals need to be rational and reasonable, and that invariably entails taking into account relevant considerations and excluding irrelevant considerations. Um, there's a question here as well about, you know, all of these things ultimately are, are the product of a contract of employment. So how do these regulations affect the, the, the employment contract? Um, uh, you know, you may have accepted the contract based on various factors, um, including the level of pension contribution, medical scheme options. These could be material changes. So I think uh, I'm happy to go to you now, Lissander, now that I've mixed sort of six questions together. 
maybe you could comment on two things for us. Um, the one would be the, uh, the question of what can be deducted from the TERS benefits uh, in these circumstances. And the other one is just the relationship between the employment contract and these regulations. You know, what, what can and can't be done. And, and is it temporary or is it permanent? I think that's relevant to hold something off, i.e. relax the employment contract or are we uh, are negotiating something new every time now? Just before you answer, just a reminder, about 60% of us have completed the poll, which is a great outcome. But if you would still like to complete the poll, we'll be closing it in the next minute or so. So please, uh, please attend to that right away. Thank you, Lysander. Thanks, David. When it comes to the TERS benefit, the TERS benefit has been held to not to amount to remuneration. So to the extent that there are deductions that are made from employee remuneration, those cannot be made from the TERS benefits purely by virtue of understanding that the TERS benefit is not remuneration. To the extent though that the employee would still like to make contributions to their medical aid, pension fund, etc. Nothing precludes the employee agreeing with the employer that the employer may still make those deductions um, and pay them over onto the appropriate fund on behalf of the employee. So it's not a legal right that the employer has to make deductions from the TES benefits, but it is something that they can be agreed between the employer and the employee in order to make sure that the employee continues to have those benefits and that those benefits are not put at risk. Um, I think to move on to your next question, it was about the employment contract um, and what happens in relation to those contractual rights at this time. The things that are contained in the employment contract, there would have to be an element of consultation in order to change the terms and conditions um, of employment. Um, for example, there was a question about the travel allowance and can the employer now just unilaterally take the travel allowance away? Um, in, in order to save costs? Um, and the answer is no, because the, if the travel allowance is contained in the employee's employment contract, that change to terms and conditions of employment um, couldn't be unilaterally done by the employer and certainly not without legal risk. So it would be something for consultation between the employer and the employee. I think factually some of the things that have happened here um, on the comments, you know, for example, about the increased provision of, of data. I think they, you know, there are many people who don't have an employment contract saying you'll be given certain amount of gigs of data. Um, but right now they are receiving the data. Um, but part of that is a function of being um, working from home, being required to work from home by your employer and being required to work from home by the law and the regulations um, in themselves. And for those employers who need their employees to, re to continue to work from home, they're providing the employees with the data as a tool for the employee to work from home. So yes, on the one hand, it is a benefit to the employee, but on the other hand, it, it is also a function of business continuity for the employee to be able to do um, the work of the employer. Thanks, Lysander. There, uh, Deirdre, a, a question has come in about whether an insurer um, uh, can agree to give a premium holiday, uh, for example, where you have group risk benefits. Um, uh, if, you took a, if you could negotiate a premium holiday, um, would those benefits still be in place for the employees? Is there any reason that can't happen? I think that those benefits should still be us um, in place. The whole, as I understand it, when the FECA issued the two insurance exemptions, it allowed for, uh, you know, for the short-term insurers, the long-term insurers, it allowed for this premium relief. Um, and I'm just going to read the definition of premium relief, which for me suggests that these benefits need to still be in place. But, you know, of course, it depends on the policy and what the insurer says. So what the exemption allows for is premium relief means a temporary release from the obligations to pay the premium payable under an existing policy in the whole or in part, either by allowing the non-payment of premium for a limited amount of time, allowing for an extended period of grace for the payment of 
the premium or a reduction in the amount of the premium payable for a limited uh, amount of time without reducing or limiting any policy benefits under the policy. So that suggests that those, those benefits still need to be in place, but of course, again, that would need to be negotiated with the, with the insurer. The fact that these exemptions are out there doesn't automatically mean that, you know, as a policy holder, whether it's a fund or employer, you automatically entitled to these, um, you know, these premium relief, these contribution or premium holidays need to be assessed case by case. Cool. Graham, um, an interesting question. I think Lysander kind of touched on it, but perhaps you can delve on a bit more is this question of in, in, in pension fund rules, there will often be uh, an absence from service rule. Uh, if somebody is temporarily uh, there, then you know, it, it has various consequences. Um, if people are working uh, remotely and are effectively not doing that, which we, that they were contracted to do uh, in the current circumstances, they're doing less than, or maybe materially less than, um, then it, should that be regarded as absence from service, either in terms of retirement fund rules interpretation or generally in terms of conduct under their employment contract? Uh, I, think that, I think that the moment you allow an employee to continue to tender to work on a day, albeit partially for the day, albeit for a full day, but you don't have sufficient work for them, they're still tendering. Your obligation as the employer is to deliver the full package of your remuneration promised to them, even if you don't have enough work to them. It's like an employee comes to work physically, but you don't have enough work to give them physically in the office. There you've got to actually make a call. You know, are you going to allow a worker to partially tender or are you going to have to come to another arrangement with them because there isn't sufficient work? Then you're into you know, looking at short time, which you've got to do by negotiation. You're going to have to look to putting people on leave, which a lot of employers have done during this period because an employer is able to determine uh, when an employee should take leave if they're unable to reach agreement on the, on the accrued leave. So all of those things would need to be taken into account. I don't think it would fall within your ordinary absence from work provision you'd find in your retirement fund rules. Those contemplate more a scenario where somebody has gone on secondment overseas, which of course you can't do no more, but you've gone off three months overseas or whatever it is, and you're temporarily absent on those kind of situations. And the idea behind that is to retain membership and particularly retain the risk benefits if they're provided through the fund. But I don't think we're talking about that in a partial performance from home situation. Thank you. Um, there, there's a question here. I'm aware of the time though. Um, we're at 10.58 people may have meetings to go to after this. Um, I will be wrapping up very shortly. If it's not exactly at 11, it will be very shortly after that. Um, there are lots of questions. Yeah, I think I've tried to sort of squeeze them together into categories so you can get somewhat of an answer. Um, Deirdre, the, briefly, the uh, intention to stop or reduce retirement fund contributions. Is the employer obliged under the regulation, well, generally, only to communicate with the board of trustees because that's what the regs anticipate, or is the employer obliged to communicate with the members of the funds themselves if they intend to be putting in place uh, a stopping or a reduction uh, of retirement fund contributions? They definitely would need to liaise with the employees. I mean, as as Graham mentioned, that is part of your, your benefits. So if you're going to touch with that, reduce it, et cetera, your, your first port of call would be to liaise with your, with your employees. What the FECA notice did also say actually had placed the obligation on uh, the funds and said funds where there's going to be a reduction or suspension or whatever it is, um, the funds need to liaise with those, the, those members. But I mean that's a that's a separate legal relationship. The the employer would need to would need to inform the employees. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm just having a quick scroll here. Um, Lysander, perhaps you can close for the our poll results have come up, so uh, I'll I'll talk through those in a second. I'm just going to ask Lysander to answer uh, one question, which will be our last question. I think it's of relevance to others. If you look at the UIF. Uh, 
it is a benefit that is offered for employers to take up. What happens if the employer doesn't apply for that, uh, that, that relief on behalf of its employees? Um, um, can the employees in some way uh, create pressure or motivate for, for, for the benefit to be taken up? Or is this entirely uh, an, an employer discretionary decision? And you know, depending on how the employer does exercise that discretion, um, what uh, what kind of circumstances may be that may be uh, letting themselves in for? And there's been okay. to take matters into the and to alert to that situation. Um, Lissanda, we're struggling with your line. Graham, are you able to quickly jump in on that question? Will you ask it again, David? I was reading um, poll results. No, yeah, interesting, isn't it? Uh, Lysander seems to be blinking again. So, Lysander, yeah. uh, can I'm you back. read your answer? Okay. Yes, I was saying, David, that um, in terms of claiming UIF, um, where the employer hasn't claimed, um, the regulations have been amended now so that employees are able to approach the UIF themselves to the extent that they're employer um, is uh, negligent and, and, and not claiming um, on their behalf. Thank you, Lysander. I think that's a good place to wrap up. Um, you can see the poll results, which uh, um, our uh, guys, uh, Kavesh and Simon, have posted for us. So thank you very much. It's been a great response to the polls. It's been a great response to the Q&A as well. Um, we had about 170 participants, uh, so thank you for, 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 for coming through, and we've had about 36 questions. What we'll do is we'll have a look at these questions, and if any of them, um, uh, you know, maybe suggest that, that we should be contacting you, um, we'll, we'll, we'll consider that, but please take it that uh, questions that weren't answered so far. Unfortunately, there were just too many to get through. So I want to thank the audience for your uh, enthusiastic participation, uh, wherever we gave you the opportunity, uh, for the very insightful questions. Um, thank you to Lysanda, Graham, um, and Deirdre for your presentations, for your answers, and for some of your own challenges you've thrown out. We enjoyed very much being with you today, even though we couldn't see you and you could only see us. Um, we will send you the recording very soon as promised. And we will be having another uh, one of these webinars quite soon. We'll be dipping into a number of topics, including um, deep diving a little bit deeper than one usually does into the context of uh, sustainable and, and impact investing uh, among uh, sort of institutional investors, which is our pension funds and our medical schemes. So we certainly hope you'll be able to join us. Look out for that invitation. Let your friends know. Um, but other than that, uh, thank you very much. Goodbye and keep safe.